Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Bears Grove this beautiful Sunday morning. Nice and brisk outside. Hope you're enjoying the weather. Can I get a good morning back? Good morning. All right. All right. Let's start this morning with God you reign. Please stand and join us.
He's on his throne. He's in control and he reigns. Amen. Amen. Well, let's continue with all hail the power of Jesus' name. Good morning. good morning. It's good to see you all here today. I want to welcome you to Barry's Grove Baptist Church. We're glad that you are here to worship with us today as we continue our journey through the book of Revelation and as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, which is always one of my favorite things to do as a church. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we will celebrate today. Lord, we gather together because of the hope we have in Christ. And Lord, every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are reminded of what you have done to give us hope. And Lord, it reminds us of what we have to look forward to. Because Lord, we know that every time we take the Lord's Supper, we proclaim his death until he comes again. And Lord, we look forward to that day with great anticipation. Lord, even as we look in the book of Revelation, we are reminded that the time is short that you will soon be coming again, and as your people, Lord, we look forward to that day. But Lord, today, we pray that you would encourage us through your word, through song, through the fellowship of the believers. Lord, we pray that you would be glorified and honored in the service, that our hearts might be refreshed 
and that we would leave with great joy. In Jesus' name, amen. We're continuing in our journey through the book of Revelation, and we're in chapter 7 today. Of course, last week we saw uh, the beginning of the end with the judgments. Well, was, I guess it was two weeks ago now. Uh, the beginning of the end with the judgments that were unleashed after Jesus took the seals off of the scroll. And the last thing we saw in Revelation 6 was the question of those who were coming under the judgment of God, and they said, who is able to stand? Well, today in chapter 7, we get to see who is able to stand, and it's good news for us. Eric's going to come. He's going to get us started by reading our Old Testament passage, one that should be very familiar to you in Psalm 23. All right. <clears throat> We're going to be in Psalm 23 this morning for our Old Testament reading, like Craig said. And he said it's a familiar passage, though it's probably more familiar in a different translation. Um, but uh, before we get to that, speaking of translations, um, we have our, our memory verse from two weeks ago, um, that really short one out of Joel um, that Craig saved for me to do. Uh, and I, I hope you used what was printed in your bulletin because even in CSB is different translations for that, that verse, which if you remember kind of tripped us up as we tried to, uh, to say it together. So I hope you used the, uh, the bulletin version if you studied that. So that was from Joel chapter 2, verse 1. So if you memorize it, if you would, say it with me now. Blow the ram's horn in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the residents of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. In fact, it is near. All right. I think you'll be more familiar with Psalm 23. <laughs> We'd probably stand a better chance of saying that whole chapter. Yes. <laughs> so Psalm 23, beginning in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. We see. Oh. It's half a line on the next page. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. So much for doing a better job of knowing that whole chapter. Uh, I'll tell you. So, so moving on to the Lord's Supper. Uh, Craig did tell me to keep it short, so I tried to shorten it. Um, <laughs> so the, the Lord is my shepherd. I, I have what I need. Um, we see him leading me down, in the, making me lie down in the green pastures, leading me beside quiet waters. He, he gives provision. He gives safety. Uh, he renews my life and leads me along the right path. He guides me in the way I should go as the good shepherd. Even when we go through the, the darkest valley, the, the most dangerous of, of places, he is with us. He comforts us. He gives us peace. And then talking about preparing a table uh, in the presence of my enemies. Is there any better chapter to, to paint a picture of what we see in Revelation? where God has those who are, who are following him, and yet we should not fear, even though there is danger all around, there are trials and tribulations, and those who have rejected God are having judgment uh, rain down upon them. And because God, it tells us in his word that, that he takes the, the, the foolish things of man to, to shame the wise, but because 
that's the way God works in, in his irony, right? In Revelation chapter 7, in our memory verse that we'll have for today, it says, the lamb will shepherd them. So we have the good shepherd, and the good shepherd is the lamb. Uh, we're to follow the lamb. Jesus is the lamb of God. He is the perfect sacrifice, and he is the good shepherd. And it says in our, our memory verse as well, he will guide us to the springs of the waters of life. He is the one who provides, who gives life, who restores us and sustains us. Um, he is our good shepherd, the lamb. Uh, so I, as we go into this time of, of prayer, I just want us to, to praise him and thank him that, that he is the lamb, the perfect sacrifice, the one whose, whose blood was shed for us. And yet he is at the same time the good shepherd who will lead us and provide for us. A, a very fitting image as we take the Lord's Supper today. So let's pray. Father God, we come to you praising you and thanking you this morning. Lord, for the Lamb who is at the same time the, the shepherd, the good shepherd. Lord, we thank you for the, the lamb, the perfect sacrifice, the one whose, whose blood was shed, who was our, our perfect atonement. So that we may be part of your flock, so that we might be anointed and blessed in the presence of our enemies, God. God, we thank you. We thank you for the good shepherd who cares for his flock, who would lay down his life for those who are his. And he invites all to, to join his flock. They will know him as, as Lord, as Savior. Lord, I, I pray that everyone in here this morning has that type of relationship with the Good Shepherd. And Lord, I, I pray that we would, we would honor you that we would give you all glory and praise as we remember that sacrifice through the Lord's Supper this morning. Lord, I pray that you would open hearts and ears to receive your word and open mouths to praise your name. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We have another old hymn this morning that I think you'll enjoy. And it's ironic. I didn't know we were doing the Lord's Supper when I put this music together. So the Lord is in control. Are you washed in the blood? Please stand and join us.
Thank you, praise team. Well, we didn't talk about what the passage was or about the Lord's Supper, but those songs sure fit with what we're going to talk about. That's, that's good. That's real good. <clears throat> talk about seeing the enemy run. You know, when we left off in the book of Revelation, we see the judgment of God is a scary thing. And who is able to stand in the face of that? You know, it's interesting if you think about how North Carolina got its nickname, the Tar Heel State. It's much debated. It goes back to the large production of tar and turpentine because we've got all those pine trees, right? You've seen a few of them, I'm sure. But we shipped a lot of it over to England where they built their ships with that then they floated over here and fought against us with. It's disputed that part of the name came from the fact that <clears throat> when Lord Cornwallis and his troops forded the Tar River on their way to Yorktown, that the residents dumped tar in the river in order to slow them down. And that when they came out of the river, they had tar on their heels. That's probably just a legend, though. More likely, it came from Civil War times when we were fighting up in Virginia. And during a battle, the only troops that stayed in their position and stood their ground were the ones from North Carolina. So when the other troops who had fled came back, the ones from North Carolina said they needed to stick some tar on their heels so they would stick better in the next fight. It's claimed that General Robert E. Lee purportedly said after a battle that the soldiers from North Carolina performed valiantly and said, God bless the Tar Heel boys. That's probably not true, though. It's probably made up. But everybody agrees on one thing. It had originally been a derogatory name because yep. making tar was nasty, smelly, messy. And it was seen as something beneath those of noble heritage. But it was something that the people of North Carolina came to embrace because it was a picture of their courage to stand their ground. Now here's the thing. It takes more than tar on your heels to stand courageously in battle when the enemy is approaching. Yeah. And it takes more than courage to take a stand when God's judgment is coming. You know, that question at the end of chapter 6 gets me. Verse 17. It's talking to people or talking about the judgment that's coming and they, they, were, they were wanting to hide from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb because the great day of the wrath has come. And who is able to stand? And then we get chapter 7. The interlude between the seals that Jesus is removing from the scroll, unleashing the judgments. And what we see is a picture of who is able to stand. And it is a wonderfully encouraging message for us. And that's what I want you to see. You know, when we look at the book of Revelation, it's a pretty scary book. But I want to remind you, it was written to encourage believers. Not just the ones of the seven churches who these letters were written to earlier, but also to us today. Because it is a reminder that we will be able to stand because of our Savior. And that's our hope. So no matter what happens in the world around us, we are safe in his hand and no one can snatch us out. So let's read our text <clears throat> out of Revelation chapter 7. And uh, as we do that, we will see our memory verse come up. It is the last verse, so we'll go ahead and read it because I'll forget to get you to read it with me if I go ahead and read through and ask you to join me. So let's read Revelation seven seventeen. For the Lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them. He will guide them to springs of the waters of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's an encouraging message, isn't it? Starting back in verse 1. <clears throat> After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, 
restraining the four winds of the earth so that no wind could blow on the earth or on the sea or in, on any tree. Then I saw another angel rising up from the east who had the seal of the living God. He cried out in a loud voice to the four angels who were allowed to harm the earth and the sea, don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we seal the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the Israelites. 12,000 sealed from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 sealed from the tribe of Benjamin." After this I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and along with the elders and the four living creatures, they fell face down before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, who are these people in white robes and where did they come from? I said to him, sir, you know. Then he told me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. The one seated on the throne will shelter them. They will no longer hunger. They will no longer thirst. The sun will no longer strike them, nor will any scorching heat. For the lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them. He will guide them to springs of the waters of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord, as we look at your word today, and Lord, we see this message of hope for your people. Lord, we thank you. And we are reminded that no matter what is going on around us in this world, we can trust you because you hold us in your hand. So Lord, we look forward to that great and glorious day when you return. But until that day, we pray that you would strengthen us by the power of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So who is able to stand in the face of God's judgment? First, those who are sealed in the name of God. Now chapter 7, as I've already said, is an interlude between the opening of the 6th and 7th seals. We'll see this pattern repeated later with an interlude between the 6th and 7th trumpets. Remember that the seals and the trumpets and the bowls are the judgments of God that overlap with one another and they telescope with one another to the end as they increase in the intensity of the judgments until the final end of everything. So John receives two visions here in chapter 7 that are connected and they provide a picture of who is able to stand before the judgment of God and triumph. So as the first vision unfolds, John sees the four angels who are given authority by God to carry out the judgments on the earth and says they're at the, the, the four corners of the earth. That just indicates the totality of the earth, the north, the south, the east, and the west. So they cover the whole earth. They were restraining the winds of God's judgment from destroying everything. And these four angels are commanded by an angel that comes from the east. Now the east is significant because it's the place of the rising sun. It's also the direction in which the temple faced and it was supposed to be the direction from which his salvation would come and deliver his people. So this angel from the east bore the seal of the living God. This is not the same as the seals that are on, that are on the scroll. These seal, this seal <clears throat> would be like a signet ring or something that was given to a representative of the king to carry out his orders with his authority. So this angel commands the other angels not to unleash the ferocity of God's judgment until God's servants have been sealed on their foreheads. Now, Revelation 14.1 also refers to this group by saying that this seal is the Father's name. Then I looked, 
And there was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So the picture here is that the seal, the identifying mark that God places on his people is his name. This certainly draws from the vision that Ezekiel had in Ezekiel chapter 9 where he was getting ready to destroy the city. But he told the angel to pass through the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the detestable practices committed in it. In other words, he was going to spare a remnant when he destroyed Israel at, in, in the Old Testament times. And we see now that at the final judgment, he is sparing another remnant. So then we get to the 144,000, right? Because we know that's a much debated topic. Who are these 144,000? And no, we do not believe, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, that those are the people that have already been sealed and are already in heaven. All right, so let's just get that one out of the way right to start with. But this number's been hotly debated for over 2,000 years. It's, highly, it's a highly symbolic number. It's later used to represent the area of the New Jerusalem in cubic miles. It's a picture of perfection. Twelve was the number of the tribes of Israel. Twelve was the number of the apostles. We have 24 elders around the throne of God who represent both of those groups. A thousand is another highly symbolic number in the book of Revelation used to indicate perfection as with the thousand year or millennial reign that we'll see later. So what we have here is a perfect representation of Israel that has been sealed to protect from the judgment that is to come. Now when we look at the list of the tribes, we see that they aren't the normal list of tribes. Uh, the tribe of Dan is missing, as is Joseph is in place of his son Ephraim, uh, when his other son Manasseh is named. So that's a little strange. Most commentators believe that was due to gross idolatry in both those tribes, but as we know, idolatry was a problem with every tribe uh, of ancient Israel. So we can't really explain that. But the bigger question for many people is this. What Israel are we talking about? Are we talking about the nation of Israel? Or are we talking about the church and the Israel is a representation of the church? What exactly are we talking about here? Well, I think Romans 11, uh, 25 through 27 promises us that God is going to save a remnant from his nation, Israel. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so you will not be conceited. A partial hardening, a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So the bottom line is God has promised he is going to save a remnant of of Israel after all the Gentiles have been saved as a result of the hardening of the nation of Israel. I certainly believe that that is a possibility of what we have here is a picture of this final ingathering. However, there's also the possibility, it's a symbolic uh, number that could lead one to believe that this vision is linked to the next vision of the multitude in heaven. And it's an ideal picture of, the, of what we actually see in heaven. Folks, I'm going to tell you what, if it sounds complicated to you, it is. It made my head spin as I worked through different commentaries this week, trying to figure out exactly where I landed on this. But I think Simon Kistemacher has a great quote. He says, the great multitude comes forth out of the 12 tribes of Israel. In response to the Great Commission, a worldwide multitude has come to faith in Christ that with the saints of the Old Testament constitutes the full number of God's servants. In other words, what we get here is a complete picture of God's kingdom made up both of faithful Israel in this vision and the Gentiles from every people in the next vision so that every people group on earth is represented as making up the people of God. And what we have is a beautiful picture of heaven where the great diversity of God's creation is represented as celebrating the glorious salvation that he has given them. Now, I think the key to understanding this, since John is only telling us what he saw, he's not giving us any real commentary, is that we can't get lost in the weeds of the details, but focus on what is being said to encourage the people that he's writing to, which includes us. We know he was originally writing to seven churches in existence at the time of his writing, but his writing is also intended to be for us today. So what exactly was he trying to encourage them with? <clears throat> The bottom line of what we see here is that those who are able to stand have been sealed by God with his name and thus are perpetually 
and eternally his. Amen. That's the key. Once God has put his seal on you, nothing can take you away from him. Yes. That's what I want you to get today. You know, <clears throat> let's remember, <clears throat> the Bible is, everything is connected. I don't know if you realize this or not, right? Everything is connected in the Bible. Don't forget that Israel was chosen to represent God to the surrounding nations so that in them people would see him and be drawn to worship him, okay? So when we understand that, they were carrying the hope of salvation for all people. They were the first fruits of God's salvation plan. That's the bottom line. They were the first fruits. What God first gave to them, he later gave to the Gentiles by faith. Not only did the law come through Israel, but also the gospel. But when the gospel came, so did the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit was given then as well. And the Holy Spirit was given to the believing Jews. Then it was progressively given to the Samaritans, and who were half Jewish. And then finally, to the Gentiles. It follows the pattern of what Jesus said in Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So we see that the gospel moved out from the Jews to those who were related ethnically to the Jews to finally those who were unrelated to the Jews, right? So we see how this spreads out. So the first group that we encounter in Revelation as being sealed by God, it should not surprise us, is Israel, followed by the rest of the nations that he will see in the second vision. And just as Israel was sealed, so will all believers be. What are we sealed with? We've already seen that they were sealed with the name of God. But how does God put his name on us? Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 tells us how we are sealed. In him you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. What is our inheritance? It is God. Do you remember when, when God uh, gave the Levites their inheritance? Their inheritance was what? Him. They didn't get land. They got God. God was their inheritance. Well, I want you to understand something. For all who are saved, God is the one that we inherit. We inherit this wonderful eternal relationship with him that never ends. And we have the fullness of his presence before us always. And so ultimately what he gives us now is his presence as a down payment through the Holy Spirit. Yes. It's not perfect. It's tainted by the sin of this world. But it gives us a hunger for what is yet to come. And so we are sealed. His name is not just on us. His name lives in us. Isn't that wonderful? Man, that is so incredibly comforting to know that the devil cannot claim us and God's judgment cannot destroy us. Yes. We are his. No matter how bad things get in this world, we don't have anything to fear because of that. You ever gotten exclusive access to... A con at a concert or at a ball game or something where you got to go backstage or go in the locker room or meet, meet people that were, you know, pretty high up or whatever. If you've ever gotten to do that, it's, 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 it's neat. I've gotten to do it once or twice, not much. And, you know, you, 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 feel, you feel special and you feel important, but it's only because you know someone. It's not because you're special or important, or I'm special and important. It's just the fact that I know someone who's special and important, and I get access to their benefits because I know them. Yes. Well, I want you to understand, the same thing is true for all of us who are sealed by God and claimed by Him. It's not that we are special or important in any way. It's that we know the one who is special right. and important. And because he has put his mark on us, we are able to enjoy the benefits that he has to offer. We have exclusive access to the Lord and to his abode in heaven. What a wonderful thing that is. My question for you today is, have you availed yourself of these blessings and this protection that God is offering to you? 
Because if not, today you need to trust in him for your salvation. You know, I just can't imagine how people can go through life without having an assurance of what's going to happen to them at the end. When God has offered to us such a sweet salvation in our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you don't know him, I pray that you would come to know him today. But if you do know him, my invitation is don't despair at what you see around you. Folks, when we look at the world, it is so easy for us to throw up our hands and stick our heads in the sand. What I want you to understand is you don't have any reason to fear because you can trust in his promise that will not fail. He will take care of you. Second, those who are able to stand are washed in the blood of the Lamb. I'm so glad you played that song when it was one of my points, but by the time I had my points set up, I knew you'd already done the music. I figured I could slip in that invitation on him, but I didn't know about that one. So God knows what he's doing. But those who are washed in the blood of the Lamb can stand in the face of God's judgment. So John receives this second vision immediately after the first, and this time it's a vision of heaven around the throne of God. And in heaven around the throne of God, he saw a vast multitude that was so great it could not be numbered, made up of people from every group on earth, using the same four words to describe the diversity we saw in the song that was sung by the elders and the four living creatures in chapter 5. In other words, there was no people group on earth left unrepresented before the throne of God. And so it fulfilled what Jesus said would happen. Remember Matthew 24, 14, he said, This good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. It's not just that it's going to be preached to all people, but that some people in every group are going to be saved. And they're going to be represented around his throne before the judgment comes. Because it is God's intention to save some from every group. Yes. He created them in his image. He intends to preserve them for eternity. Now these people had on white robes that were gathered around the throne. And these are the same white robes that were promised to those who persevered under persecution in Sardis in chapter 3. It's a picture of purity. It's a picture of holiness. It's a picture of the imputed righteousness that we have received from Christ, as we'll see later in this passage. They were waving palm branches. That was a reminder of the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem as they celebrated the coming of their king, the son of David, their Messiah, the victory that had been obtained by him. So the scene is one of pure joy. As the multitude praises God for their salvation. Look at it. Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. Oh, think about this. I mean, here they are. They've been taken out of the world. They've been taken away from the judgment. They're celebrating their salvation around their throne. And they know it's all because of the Lamb. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. And their worship of the Lamb and the one who's seated on the throne prompts worship among the angels, the elders, and the four living creatures as they join in together with their own sevenfold praise of God. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. And here's what's beautiful about this picture is that all these songs are sung in one voice. With one language. It's the reversal of the curse of the Tower of Babel. Think about that. What happened at the Tower of Babel? They were building this great tower that would reach up to heaven. Because basically, they thought they were gods. And so they began this ambitious project to build this tower to heaven. To where they could reach the highest heavens and reach God and all this. And God looked down and he said, well, we got to put a stop to this. And so he just created all these different languages so that the people could no longer communicate. And it created divisions between people. It created fear between people. It created conflict between people. And do you know that today there are 11,243 different language groups? Research has shown 11,200. We we think about major world languages. I want you to understand in many countries there are local dialects. We have them here. If you ever talk to somebody from Boston or New York, I promise you, they don't talk like we do down here, right? 
but it's not quite the same. These are really different languages, yeah. right? So you have all these different languages and dialects, 11,243. Now, here's the sad part about that. It means you also have to translate the gospel into all those languages for people to be able to understand the truth. So there are still 3,056 unengaged groups, which means they have no known Christians. They have no known witnesses who are working with them. And for the most part, they also have no scriptures in their language, either written or audio. Think about that. Over 3,000 different language groups, and they don't have any access to the gospel. Folks, that's the curse of Babel. But the good news of what we see here is that God's work is not done, and it will be completed. Yes. It'll be completed by us. Yes. He's calling the church to finish the task of taking the gospel to the nations so that around his throne, every different people group will be there praising God with one voice. What a beautiful picture of how God takes something awful and makes it beautiful. You know, Paul described what the church is supposed to look like. He said, just as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many are one body, so also is Christ. And he's talking about the beauty of the diversity of the church, but how we're all unified in Christ. And it is a wonderful thing that we see here on earth, but it will never compare to what we'll see in heaven. When this is displayed on a much grander scale, with much greater diversity. How beautiful that will be. But where did all these people come from? I mean, he says it's so vast of a multitude that they couldn't be counted. Well, where did they come from? So the elder asked John that question. He, he asked him, he says, where did these people come from? And that was just a rabbinical teaching tool. You ask questions to elicit answers from yourself. Because basically the student would say, I don't know, but you do. And then the teacher would tell them. And that's exactly what John does. John defers to his authority as a representative of the redeemed around the throne. And the elder tells him that these people have come out of the great tribulation. And again, we have a much debated issue. What exactly is he talking about when he says the great tribulation? And when did they come out of the great tribulation? Were they raptured out of the tribulation? Were they taken away before the wrath of God was poured out? Were they taken out sometime in the middle, near the end? Were they part of the ones who were killed for their faith to complete the number that the Lord talked about in chapter 6? Remember that when the souls who were under the altar cried out for justice and God told them that they had to wait until the number of those who would be killed for their faith was completed? So is this group that? I don't know. It's a pretty big group to represent that. So... Again, we're not given much detail. John doesn't give us much detail. He just lays out what he saw and what he heard. Now, I think it's important that we recognize that. Some things are for God to know and not for us. So we can't figure out everything in the Bible. We had this discussion in our Sunday school class this morning. It's amazing to think there's so much in the Bible that we can only grasp a small part of because, quite frankly, some things belong to God. Some things are his special knowledge. I can't tell you exactly who these people are. I can't tell you exactly when they came out of the Great Tribulation. I'm not even sure I can tell you exactly what that Great Tribulation refers to, what it refers to the persecution that has been going on since the time Christ left, or if it's just referring to the Great Tribulation at the end. You know, Jesus makes a statement that after the destruction of Jerusalem, he says at that time there will be great distress. That's the same word as tribulation. <clears throat> the kind that hasn't taken place from the beginning of the world until now and never will again. Unless those days were cut short, no one would be saved. So the point there is, is there's been a tribulation that's been going on ever since Jesus left this world and Christians have been persecuted. And actually, if you read Hebrews chapter 11, you can say that actually goes back to the faithful of the Old Testament yes. who suffered for their faith in God. And I would think that this vast multitude that cannot be numbered would include people from all that time. But at the same time, it certainly could apply to that great tribulation, the time of when the woes intensify before the end and persecution increases and they come out of that. Well, here's the thing. 
whether they are taken out of it before any of it, or in the middle of it, or right before the end, it doesn't seem to be the concern here. We're not told. You know, I honestly have never been a pre-tribulation rapture guy, but I've always said that I hope that pre-tribulation rapture people are right. Right? I, I, I don't personally want to suffer greatly in the great tribulation. I don't think anybody would say they want to suffer. And I would welcome, I would welcome being taken out of that. I don't think you can prove that clearly in the scripture. And I'm not sure what the answer is to that question. But I know what I see here in the book of Revelation tells me, number one, that I need to be ready to be persecuted. Yes. We all need to be prepared to suffer for our faith. And number two, I need to remember that God has me safe in his hand yes. so that nothing can happen to me. Nothing can happen to me. Nothing can take me away from him. Oh, it doesn't mean I will avoid all suffering in this world. But it does mean that I can be sure that I can stand in the face of judgment. Yes. I can stand. And the point that we see here is that we can trust that no matter how great persecution becomes, no matter how great tribulation becomes, we can rest assured that God's purpose in the Great Commission will be accomplished. So we don't stop telling people the gospel. No matter how much persecution increases, no matter how bad the tribulations might be that we experience, we can trust that God is going to use our witness to draw people to Him and build up that vast multitude to a point that it cannot even be counted. Yes. He wins. Don't ever forget that. That's the point of the book of Revelation. God wins. It's so easy to look around at our world and want to give up Oh, things are so bad. Oh, it's just getting worse. Yeah. But don't ever let that cause you to forget. He wins. And you can depend on him because you're safe in him. So be encouraged in your mission. But I think one point that we can all agree on is that God's people will be spared the final judgment. I think that's what we see very clearly here. They will be spared the final judgment and they will be empowered to stand before him on that day, worshiping him for his great salvation. But how that salvation is obtained is the focal point of what we need to understand about this passage. The bottom line is that every person in heaven will be there because they washed their robes. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of of the Lamb. Think about that for a second. We sang that song earlier, Are You Washed in the Blood of the Lamb? You know, a lot of churches today, they, they took their songs out that have blood in them. They don't like to talk about the sacrifice that Jesus made. They don't like to think about that it was a, you know, it was an atonement for sin. People have taken that wording just out of their whole lexicon. And we want to discuss it. Oh, Jesus' death was just an example. It was just an example of you know, self-sacrifice, but it really wasn't, you know, it wasn't atoning for our sins. It didn't pay for anything. Well, I don't know what Bible they're reading. Because if nothing else, I mean, I could point you to a whole lot of other passages, but this one makes it very clear that the only reason anyone is in heaven is because they've washed their robes in the blood of Christ. In other words, the robes that were stained with sin that made us filthy and un, unacceptable to God, he has taken those, and in one of the weirdest paradoxes you're going to find in the Bible, he takes a dirty, stained robe, and he washes it in blood until it comes out white. Yes. How about that? You know, the idea goes back to Isaiah 118. The Lord says, come, let's settle this. Though your sins are scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are crimson red, they will be like wool. But they're made white by the blood of Christ. Yes. 1 John 1, 7 tells us how that works. He says, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Because of our sin, we cannot enter into the presence of God, but because of Jesus' sacrifice, we can because his blood covers our sin. You remember that parable Jesus told? It was in Matthew 22, so we looked at it a few months ago. Where 
he compares the kingdom of heaven to a wedding banquet for the son of the king. And he invites all the people to come. And one guy shows up without the proper attire on. He's not wearing the proper wedding outfit. And he says, and the king went up to him and said, wear your clothes. And he couldn't answer him, so the king cast him out into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And we go, wow, that's harsh. He just throws the guy out into, into what was the way of saying hell because he didn't have the right clothes on. No, the point is that we are clothed in sin until Jesus washes us and clothes us in his righteousness. That's what he's talking about. And that's what we see here. We are going to be clothed in his righteousness. And that's what we celebrate in the Lord's Supper. That's what's so exciting about the Lord's Supper to me is it reminds us that we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ because he gave his body and his blood on the cross to pay for your sins and mine. And what we celebrate today in this small way taking these tokens that are symbolic of his sacrifice, we will one day enjoy in full forever in his presence where we can sing praise and, and, and give thanks to him for the salvation that he has provided for us. You know, those last few verses are just so wonderful. It says, you know, for this reason, they're before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. You know why they're serving him day and night? Because they recognize that since he gave everything for them, they want to give everything they can back. Yes. Because he deserves it. It says they will no longer hunger, they will no longer thirst, the sun will no longer strike them, nor will any scorching heat. For the lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them, he will guide them to springs of the waters of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. You realize that's what Psalm 23 is talking about in regard to what Eric read as to how the Lord is with us today. But ultimately, we know that sin still harms us today. But one day... When we're in his presence, sin will be no more, and suffering will be gone, and God will be our protection forever. He's going to wipe away every tear. You know, I've shared this story before, so humor me if you've heard it. But my father, when I was just a baby, his, his, fa his stepfather killed his mother and his two sisters, and uh, two half-sisters, and then killed himself. And uh, it was hard. He really struggled with that. And he said one morning, he woke, he had a dream, and he said in this dream, he said him and a whole bunch of other people were gathered around Jesus. And all these people were telling him about the struggles and sufferings that they had had while they were on earth. And he said, and Jesus would respond to each one of them. He said he couldn't understand what he said, but every time Jesus would respond to the people about what pain they went through, he would tell them what the purpose was behind it. And he said the people would stop crying and start laughing. And then he said he woke up. And then he said he just cried for an hour or two. But they weren't tears of sorrow anymore. They were tears of joy. Because he knew God is going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. All of the suffering that we experience here is going to be swallowed up one day by joy when God's great purpose is finished. And what we celebrate in the Lord's Supper today is the hope of what is yet to come. So as we close, I want you to think about a couple things. Is there some sin in your life that you need to repent of today that is hindering your joy and fellowship with the Lord? You know, before we take the Lord's Supper, it's vital that we examine ourselves to make sure that we're not living in a way that is hindering our relationship with Jesus so that we're missing out on the joy of our fellowship with him. Is Jesus receiving the best of your worship and service for what he has done? I've said this many times, but what we do here on earth is just practice for heaven. What we do on Sunday really is, it's, it's, it's like a dress rehearsal. Is he getting the best of us? When was the last time you just stopped and said thank you for what Jesus did to save you? 
you know, I think if we did that more, we'd worry a lot less. We wouldn't struggle so much with the things that are going on in our lives or in our world. If we just stopped and said thank you for what he's already done. And because of what he's already done, we know he's working right now, so we can thank him for what he's doing now. And because of both of those things, we can look forward to what he's going to do, and we can say with assurance, thank you for what is yet to come. So I'm going to ask our deacons who are going to be serving today if you would come down. And I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, spend a few minutes praying. Ask God to search your heart, to prepare you to receive the Lord's Supper with joy. Let's pray. Oh God, we ask you to search us and know us today. Lord, we recognize that our hearts deceive ourselves. Lord, sometimes we do things we don't even know why we do them or why we say them. So we ask you to search us and examine us today. Lord, reveal to us anything that maybe is not pleasing to you. Convict us of our sin and unrighteousness. And Lord, we pray that you would cleanse us today. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Lord, help us to truly take the Lord's Supper today with hearts of joy and gratitude for who you are what you have done, what you are doing, and what you're still going to do one day. Lord, fix our eyes on the hope of heaven that will sustain us through the trials of today. In Jesus' name, amen. We celebrate an open communion here at Berry's Grove, which means if you are a baptized believer, we invite you to join us as we take the Lord's Supper. We also believe in a symbolic interpretation of the Lord's Supper, that the bread represents the body of Christ. The cup represents the blood of Christ. We don't believe it is transformed into it, uh, but we do believe it is a visual reminder to us of what Jesus has done in dying for our sins. And so we invite you to join us today if you are a believer in Christ. also want to tell you that we have gone back to our old way of doing it, um, where we actually pass the bread and the cups. Um, if you are not comfortable with that, we, stu- we do still have some of our uh, closed containers uh, with the bread and cup in them. And if you just let a deacon know, he'll be glad to bring you one. Okay. Paul, would you bless the bread, please? Gracious Lord, Father, we give you thank you that we can celebrate this time together when we can remember the sacrifice that our Lord made, the one who was blameless, who was innocent, and without blemish came to this world, Lord, to not just die, but to die a death that was the worst that that could be imagined, Lord. His body was scourged, he was beaten to the point where couldn't even be recognized anymore. And Father, uh, we can take this bread now to commemorate that, to remember that, and to understand just what it is that our salvation costs. So Father, we do thank you. We ask your blessing upon it. And Father, we just 
pray that our hearts are open and that we can uh, just praise and glorify you for such a great salvation. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, <clears throat> Jesus took bread, and he broke it and blessed it, said, take eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Greg, would you bless the cup? Oh, Father, we do thank you, Lord, for your mercy, for your grace. We pray and we thank you for the flower that you have in color, for the images of Christ that you sacrificed for us. Yeah. Lord, have forgiveness of our shortcomings and our failures. Amen. And on this day, forth, we give it to you more completely. We pray to you each and every day. We do in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
He blessed it. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Oh God, we thank you for this great sacrifice that you have made for us. Thank you that the lamb was slaughtered so he could be our shepherd. So that our filthy robes could be washed white in his blood. Lord, it is so amazing what you have done for us. Lord, may we never lose sight of it. May we go out after we sing with joy for what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and join us. There is a fountain. thought to leave on. A few announcements for you this afternoon at 445 Children's Choir will be happening in the Family Life Center. 5 o'clock youth will be in the basement and then at 530 Teen Kid will be in the Family Life Center as well. Don't forget if you're on a committee <clears throat> we have our quarterly committee meetings tonight at 715. Um, if you 
If you're on a committee that maybe doesn't have a whole lot going on right now, talk to the other people on your committee and see if you need to meet. Um, but I know several committees that need to meet tonight, so please be here. We're also going to call a really, 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 really short business meeting so we can vote on some messengers for our uh, Beulah Baptist Associational meeting that's coming up October 20th. And that'll probably be as good a time as any to do it. So come on out. And uh, if you don't, we'll put you on as a messenger for the meeting. So <laughs> come here and nominate your friends who aren't here. That's the way it worked. Um, no, they're really worth going to, and I hope you'll come. Uh, Tuesday night, or Tuesday morning at 9.30 is the Ladies Bible Study. It's out in Family Life Center. Wednesday night at 7, we'll be watching the second half of the movie Tortured for Christ. Our study about that uh, will begin a week from Wednesday. If you're interested in joining us, I hope you'll uh, join us for that. I hope you'll sign up on the sheet so we can get books. Books are $5 each to go along with that. Uh, but we hope that you will come uh, because I think it's going to be an excellent study. Uh, don't forget, pray for uh, Robert Sharp and uh, Mike Young, Andy Ward, and Avery Marie uh, Sharp, who are all in Kentucky right now working, and uh, they're up there helping out Chad and Stephanie and uh, working with the people who've been um, had flooding at their homes. Pray for them. They're, I think they're coming back Tuesday. Uh, also, we're going to be having a stew to support Chad and Stephanie and their ministry up there. That's going to be on October the 8th, so it's only a couple weeks away. So you need to sign up if you want to get some stew uh, before it all gets gone. She will be in the hallway. God is good. Oh, okay. Thank you, Wilma. And, you know, I've always said it's awfully strange that some Sundays I'm the only person wearing a name tag and I'm the only one that everybody knows my name, right? <laughs> so wear your name tag. It does make a difference. People tell me that all the time. You may say, well, everybody knows me. No, they don't. You think they do. They don't know you, but they might want to get to know you. All right. Thank you, Wilma. I appreciate that. All right. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Have a blessed day.